Hello and welcome to Tiny Bunny. This is not a furry visual novel. This is a visual novel with humans. It is also a horror visual novel. It is also an incomplete visual novel. Right now, only the first chapter exists, and I don't know if they're going to do a second, third, or fourth, or fifth, because it's been like maybe two years since the first chapter was released. So yeah. Uh, I decided to read it though because um, what is there is good. So yeah. Anywho, so also this was built I think on an older version of Rempai. So certain features are not there. Like for example the back button. So if I make a mistake with reading then Oh well, you guys are gonna see it. <laughs> anyway, so... What I believe this story is about, from what little I remember from the synopsis, is that you are a kid named Anton. You are living in Russia during the Soviet Union, and you live with your mom and your father and your little sister. And there's some creepy things going on around in the forest and in in the area in general, and I think that there is a disappearance. But anyways, um, so yeah, so without further ado, let us begin Tiny Bunny. The wind clawed at my window all night long. It wandered the fields and howled like a hungry beast. An endless song weaved from all sorts of voices, shrill, gentle, sneery, twined in the air. They were shouting and laughing and arguing about something. Someone was running through the snow while casting long shadows that would occasionally creep close to my bed. Our house had a mind of its own, the creaky old mind of a building that had seen a lot in its days and was seemingly trying to share its wisdom with its inhabitants. The lonely house faced the forest and the dark green thicket, thicket gazed back with its hollow eyes, rustling, whizzing, swaying back and forth. One could come out and stand at the edge of the forest to reassure themselves. There was nobody behind the crooked trees. Fuzzy silhouettes sway in the wind couldn't possibly do us any harm. It's just a play of light and shadow. Just a play. I knew it was just my imagination. I was already 12 after all. Still. Hey, put away your book. How many times have I told you not to read at the table? It's not bad for your health. Look how slouched you are. Ah, I forgot. It's interactive. I didn't protest and put the book about Conan the Barbarian aside. I was stuck on a line that I couldn't understand after reading it three times anyway. Olya had already finished her breakfast and was munching on some cookies. She was so enthusiastic that she almost looked like your typical girl from commercials. You're not going anywhere until you finish all of it. I, on the other hand, was still trying to drill a hole in the plate with my eyes, as if it would make the porridge disappear. Hazy anxiousness welled up inside, all because of the previous sleepless night, the black forest around our house and the gloomy wind. The longer I waited, the colder the lumpy white substance became. It looked like a jellyfish from the... Costil Odyssey? I love that show. I wonder how horrifying the bottom of the ocean is. Or how cold the black forest is at night. The spoon fell out of my hand. Mom showered me with the cold glare from her green eyes. What did I just say? I get it. 
I'll get it. See? I had 10 seconds to catch my breath before battling the nasty porridge once again. I felt around for the spoon. What is this? Carved on the other side of the table. Karina. Huh, that's my mom's name. I guess she carved it out with something pointy when she was little. She sure was a rascal, damaging the furniture like that. She would scold me for a week if I did something similar, though. Should I remind her about it? No, she's been in a bit of a bad mood lately. I imagine her being my age, sitting under this table. I wonder, was Mom afraid of the dark back then? Or the sounds coming from the attic? Or the thick forest? I imagine my grandma coming into my little mom's room, sitting at the edge of her bed, where Olya sleeps nowadays, and saying this in her soft, smooth voice. Kaiga is a special place, little girl. It's watching you closely, sniffing you out, trying to discern what kind of beast you are. If you're a good sort, it won't abandon you in times of trouble. But if you're a bad apple, it'll grab you by the side and drag you under the ground. And that would be it. Grandma was caring. She never fought with anybody, never yelled, never sn swore. Those were the times without the maddening screams until late at night, without smashed dishes and mutual accusations. Our parents used to love each other back then. I remember listening in on one of their conversations by chance. They were talking about Grandma getting prepared for her own funeral. She had already bought a casket, and she called it her cute funeral box. It waited for its time in the closet patiently. It was black, upholstered with meat-colored material on the inside. I saw it when my grandma was getting buried. The house didn't change since the time that she was alive. Only all the photos were gone. Glass covered the pictures with gray faces of my ancestors. They all had a dead but watchful look in their eyes. I crawled out from under the table. Olya was done with her cookies and was looking at my share like a sly little woodland creature. I turned my gaze towards the frosted window. There was a lot of dark pines outside, but they didn't grab my attention. The pattern of the frost formed a picture on the glass. Olya, look, it's a fox. Where? It looked almost like those optical illusion thingies they put on the back of student notebooks. A mixture of lines at first glance, but if you blur your vision a little bit and look under a certain angle, not outside, on the window. Look, there's a nose, and here's... Hey, eat up. Yes, yes, just a moment. I don't see anything. Hurry up, we don't have much time. Ah... Uh... There it is, but it still doesn't look like one. And I'm telling you it does. Nuh-uh. It does. Stop it. These kids, I swear. Now I couldn't see the fox either. It disappeared. Went away. Only the frosty patterns similar to stretched out nettle leaves kept creeping up the glass. My dad entered the kitchen with long, measured steps. I want to have a beard like his when I grow up. Mom would always ask jokingly, Come on, shave it off, it stings. This was so long ago. Nowadays, rumbling doors and witty comebacks were an everyday occurrence. Olya always covered her ears whenever she hears something like, What's the point in all of this? Through the wall. It's all for your sake, Dad would reply, for the sake of our family. I always caught every second in fear of hearing the most dreaded, the deadliest word that started with a D. Devo. 
I don't even want to finish it. It was scary to imagine that me and my sister could be torn apart and taken into two different families. Anyway, your fox is nothing. I have an owl on my window. You and your owl talk again. You said that you believed me yesterday. Has anybody seen my car keys? I remember leaving them on the windowsill. Right. Maybe you did, and maybe you did not. You're a grown man, a father of two, and st Uh... Uh... <laughs> okay. Karina, please, stop. Just let me get ready in peace. Your keys are in the basket, along with the phone. Well, thank you very much. Anton, stop making a martyr out of yourself and finish eating already. And the owl. There was no owl. But there was one. It had giant glowing eyes. Oya sprang up from her chair and placed her hands on her little face, imitating a pair of eyes the size of an apple each with her fingers. Last year you had... Babai? In your closet, and now this owl? But, 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 I saw it. Oya shifted her gaze back and forth from the dad to the mom to me, but couldn't find any support. Have you thought about befriending it? You know, like feeding it with imaginary mice? Don't bully our girl. She's just afraid to sleep alone because she's still little. Oya powdered her lips in rebellion and rushed into the hallway. The staircase that led to the second floor creaked. Mom gave Dad a strict look. Oh, that look in her eyes. It's so uncomfortable to be pinned under it. Dad just snorted in reply and left, ringing with the keys that he just found. A minute had passed and the theme song from The Little Mermaid echoed through the house. It was stored on incredibly worn-out cassette tape, which Dad already had to glue together once. It's so easy to fix objects by gluing them back together, for example. But how do you fix a relationship? Mom moved to the living room and I was alone, anxiously stealing glances at the window. Oya had trouble sleeping ever since we moved to this house. She would toss and turn or curl up into a ball under her blanket. Sometimes she would jump up in the middle of the night and turn on the VCR. Cartoons helped to take her mind off all the troubles that we had with the move and our parents. And then Olya said that she saw the giant flying monster outside her window. She became obsessed with it. Our parents did everything in their power. They tried every little trick to get rid of those ridiculous spheres. Olya refused to sleep alone and didn't believe that the owl was just one of her nightmares. After tonight, I was unsure what to make of my sister's words, what to think of it myself. Can nightmares be infectious? Just last night, I couldn't get a wink of sleep and then ended up thinking of what to expect in my new school. There were a couple of days left before the beginning of a new term. My imagination drew long, twisting hallways that led to a classroom full of kids. But all the students behind their desks were simply dark figures, cut out using a template. Circular holes gaped in the middle of their faces, and pairs of eyes blinked inside those holes. It was as if some completely different creatures were looking at me from behind the flat black silhouettes. Their cruel glares, filled with icy sneers, made me shiver from head to toe. Will I survive here? Won't they gang up on me and beat me down? Stomp on me with their bloodied shoes? The damn school can burn for all I care. I just wish for anything to happen to it. Doesn't really matter what. I didn't want to go there that much. I didn't want to see people who are just itching to smack me on the head, trip me up, think of a new offensive name for me, worse than the previous one. I felt like the glasses I wore made me an outsider or some sort of monster. My gaze slid across the drawings hanging on the walls. 
I couldn't consider myself a great artist, but Olya begged me to hang them. Drawing was the only thing that made me happy as of late. The small circle of friends that I had also enjoyed my paintings, and they promised to call me from time to time. Sometimes I imagined Mom picking up the phone and saying in a cold voice, You've got the wrong number. Or, Anton is not around. Anton is not around. I imagined my future classmates lying in their beds just like me, listening to the howls of invisible werewolves outside their windows. Maybe my new classmates will like me after all. But who would ever like a boy with the glasses? I mean, my dad used to wear glasses when he was little, and now he's married to the most beautiful woman on the planet, my mom. The house creaked, pressed by the wind. The condo we used to live in, A9, floor concrete building, buzzed with neighbor's drill, mumbled with a TV set from behind the wall, cried like a baby from the big family next door. Our current house, though I can't really call it new, was completely different. It was silent and easy going during the day. Its shadows lay dormant at the corners, on the closet cobwebs and under the stairs. But they all woke up during the night. Something was watching me from every corner, almost as if the old photos of my deceased family with their ashen eyes were hanging on the walls in place of my drawings. The floor was squeaking, rusty drains were moaning, the attic was occupied by noisy drafts. One could think the house was performing some sort of demonic malady. And then I realized I was in fact hearing music. It was already playing for a good while. Somewhere at the edge of my perception, I could hear a flute. It was mixed in with the sound of wind, of the creaking old house, and my thoughts too. I stood up and rushed to the window. I wanted to reassure myself that this music was nothing more than a product of my imagination. It's not like someone is playing in there amidst the cold, snowy night, right? Someone was dancing in the field. Black silhouettes I could barely make out, with the dark forest as their backdrop. They jumped around, basked in the moonlight, and bumped into the piles of snow, rolled around and crawled on all fours. Stories about wolves playing under the moon came to mind, but these were clearly not wolves. They stood upright at times, circled around holding hands and whipping up snow disappearing into the shadows for a brief moment and then coming back. Something bizarre was going on. Shadows dancing in the starless abyss made my imagination go wild, making me anxious at the same time. Suddenly the music stopped. The dancing shadows froze in place and, I could swear, pierced me with their eyes. One of the silhouettes immediately parted from the bizarre shadow carnival and sprinted across the field with giant leaps. It glided on squeaky snow without leaving any prints, until it was devoured by the pitch a dark shadow of my house which became even darker and thicker. My heart was jumping around like the bird inside a cage. I shut the curtains with a swift motion and stepped back towards the bed. They saw me. A freezing torrent of fear watched over me. I stood in the middle of a perfectly dark room and listened to some unwanted guests move and scrape around looking for an entrance. The sound moved to the right, then circled around the house. Now my guest should be at the front door. I jumped into the bed and covered myself with a blanket as if it could protect me. The shackles of fear locked my muscles. I remembered the funeral, my grandma lying there, hands across her chest, her facial features sharp like that of a tin doll. Ants running up and down the legs of the chairs, that held my grandma's casket. I imagined those little creatures climb up onto her head and pulling up her eyelids with their tiny legs. Then her wrinkly eyeballs would once again move inside their sockets and she'd be able to see her grandchildren. I was chanting the spell that she taught me throughout the whole procedure. And now, lying under the blanket and listening to the squeaks and howls, I was repeating the same words. On the island of Bayam, Underneath the blemished sun, in the sea of color blue, stands a cabin made of wood. 
There lay lard and ashen hair for the spawn from Devil's Lair to feast and always leave alone, God's faithful servant named Anton. Evil leave this house must. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Bizarre sounds had disappeared. I cautiously peeked out from under the blanket and saw curtains waving around like a hangman. And then the night doused me with a new portion of boiling terror. The sound scratched at my eardrums. In reality, something or someone was scratching at the front door, clawing at wood, demanding to be let in. The door was shut. Dad had become very cautious recently, so he installed a sturdy lock. I remember him staring at the forest intently, as if he was looking for someone. Ashes to ashes. Dust to dust. I hugged my knees, placing my chin between them, and drilled the door with my eyes. It was so flimsy and weak before the might of darkness. And then... The doorknob twitched, slightly. Then it turned halfway once, twice, as if the person who tried to enter had no hands. The doorknob tilted once more and then... started clicking violently. My jaw cramped from fear, my wet fingers clutched the blanket. The door creaked and opened. The wind taunted me, moaning inside this tin drains. Now, now you'll see. The door was wide open. Darkness writhed inside the cavernous mouth of a doorway. Two. Me. It was as if the night itself was calling out to me, flapping its black wings and squeaking with rusty hinges. It was trembling and snarled by the wave of darkness that hung in the corners of my room, waiting for the one who weaved it to come out of the gaping black hole. To Nee. My abdomen tightened and my chest rose up, ready to exhale a desperate scream. But before I was able to do anything, the darkness asked, Tony, you asleep? My sister's pale face protruded from the thick shadows. And um, I almost screamed from relief. Olya? I, I'm not sleeping. Did something happen? Olya frowned and sticked out her lower lip, a clear sign that she was about to cry. It's there again, staring at me. Shoo her away, Tony, please. I'm so scared. The fear that was tormenting me just a moment ago, a goo, crawled away and hid somewhere in my stomach. I needed to calm Olya down. It was just a dream, silly. Don't be scared. Dreams don't bite. No one's gonna harm you. Olya sobbed. She was trying her best to believe me. But was I sure myself? I have an idea. Let's go to your room and watch the video, Sleeping Beauty, for example. You like that cartoon, don't you? Why does the Sleeping Beauty have a prince and I have the scary bird? That question took me by surprise. Alright, let's watch Cinderella. My thoughts became tangled, fuzzy. What was that? what studied me with its eyes while dancing feverishly under the moon. The darkness was clinging to the window, and it couldn't be fooled by Grandma's old chants. It couldn't be satisfied with the feast of lard and long ashen hair. Tony, you coming? Yes, yes, just a moment. That's why I didn't want to laugh at Olya and her owl in the morning. Who could be knocking on our door here in the middle of nowhere? We don't know anyone around here. So persistent. 
I felt extremely unsettled just from a silly thought that our morning guests could have come from the woods. I could barely hear voices coming from the front door. My mind was urging me to hide. In the closet. Under the table. Behind the curtains where Olya always hides. Tony, come here. I felt like kettlebells were tied to my feet, but still dragged them towards the hallway. A couple of policemen towered over me in the doorway. They smelled like frost and worry. My mom always winced and grumbled the moment that she saw patrol cars, worse than bandits. At that moment, though, she looked somewhat confused. Uh, hello? Senior officer who wore a grim expression nodded. A boy has gone missing yesterday. His name's Vova. Look at this, please. Have you seen him? The policeman held out a photograph to me. There was a ginger boy around the age of elementary school, pictured with a wall, carpet as the backdrop. He had a striped cat in his hands and wore a wide smile. No, I haven't. Are you sure? Look closely. Uh, where would I see him? I don't know anybody around here. I barely leave the house. Well, maybe you've seen him from the window? That's right. Your windows look straight out to the forest, don't they? The window. No, I haven't seen anything. I see. His voice was tired, but his eyes... His stare, long and heavy, was full of suspicion. I squirmed unwittingly under the weight of guilt, which his giant shadow cast over me. The policeman finally tore his eyes from me and glanced over the hallway, the stairway and the cracks in the ceiling, which I hadn't noticed before for some reason. How do you like your new place, by the way? Getting used to it? Bit by bit. It's just our little daughter misses the city a lot. Misses the city, huh? Have the locals been treating you well? Yes, everything is alright, thank you. The policeman peers through me once more. With his grey eyes, my head started spinning. Um, can I help you somehow? I asked that with a shaky voice to look like a polite boy and to end this unpleasant conversation sooner. Now that I think about it, you look just like one of my nephews, little fella. He's a witty boy around your age, wears the same type of goggles, hmm. always engrossed in reading those mystery novels. Told me that he wants to enroll into police school when his family visit us this summer. Wanted to help other people, just like me, see? I felt uncomfortable as if a distant relative and not a police officer stood before me. You know what? Little boys like you should stay at home. Stay, steer away from trouble. The times have changed so much. Mom interjected in a cold voice. You don't say. Ah, well then. What grade are you in, Tony boy? Uh, Sixth. Have you made any friends here so far? Not yet. I'll be going to school for the first time after the break. Ah, then. I'll leave you my number, just in case. Call me, if you have any new information. The policemen were gone along with their shadows. The smell of cheap cologne and the photo of a smiling boy. His face still stood before my eyes. I thought about what he felt, being all alone right now, there. For some reason, I imagined the forest swaying in the wind. What did this poor parents feel? What would my parents do if I had gone missing? Would they cry and thrash around hysterically? Or would they accuse each other like they always do and eventually forget about me? Mom, uh, this Vova, did he go missing in our forest? Seems like it. Poor child. I looked out the window, at the road. The police UAZ drove off towards the village. 
The officer's nephew came to mind while I was splitting off old paint from the windowsill. I remembered all the teenage mystery novels from the Black Kitty series I've read this summer. Your average boys and girls investigated all sorts of mysteries there. They looked for clues, spied on suspicious people. And after a set of amazing adventures, bam, solved any complicated case. They became local celebrities and must have made their parents real proud. I noticed a trail of policemen footprints that led to the forest. And then it clicked in my head. Why don't I start an investigation of my own? Maybe I'll find this lost boy. And I'll get my reward. Oya will be so happy. And not only Oya, mom and dad too. Maybe they'll even forget about their quarrels for a while. Maybe I'll even save us from the D word. I fantasized about buying Oya a Tamagotchi and getting a cassette player and a bunch of tapes for myself. And a whole box of Kinder Surprise. When was the last time that our parents bought us any toys? Last autumn, I think. My dad had lost his job at the time. There's that annoying song about it. I had little to no idea what was the accountant's job like. They counted money. Neighbors used to envy us. But nowadays, mom and dad barely had money to afford sweets, and dad would always divide a single chocolate bar between me and Olya. Sometimes I gave her my share, too. No matter how much I wanted to eat sweets, she was still just a pipsqueak. I couldn't wait to go out, looking for clues. I'm going outside. Yeah, right. You want the police to go around with your photograph next? The forest is so thick. What if the boy got snatched up by wild animals? Or something even worse? Even worse, I go throughout the hallway. I won't go far. I'll stay away from the forest. Did you hear what I said? Or should I repeat myself? You'd better pack up your school bag or go play with Olya. The sound of splashing water came from the kitchen. It meant that the argument was over and mom had the last word. Mm. I believe... Clicking here shows you all the little things that you can click on. My parents prohibited me from making long distance calls, but from time to time I really want to hear my old friends. Sometimes I would just pick up the phone, listen to the low hum of the zoomer and the distant crackling, imagining the wind howling in the isolated cords. Mom's peg top, a family relic. My mom played with it when she was little, then she gifted it to me. Olya was next in the succession line, the toy belonged to her now. She started at the dancing spindle. Oh, she stared at the dancing spindle, as if it could show her something, a fairy tale or maybe even our future. Now even my little sister was a bit too old for the old, squeaky peg top. This cross had seen so many people come and go in the house. It was black, as if absorbing all human sin from the long years that it was hanging under the ceiling. After Grandma died, Mom was going to take it off and hang a horseshoe in its place as a lucky charm, but she cut herself with the cross's sharp corners and almost fell from the stepladder. Dad called it a sign from above and ordered the cross to be left alone in its right place. I mean, you could probably put, like, the, the horseshoe, like, right here. The dark, stuffy closet. Mom says it smells like mice, but how does she know their smell? She hates it when I stick my nose in there. She's afraid that I'll cut myself on the freshly sharpened axe. And Olya can't even be lured to close it. She thinks Babai is living there. I try to help her fight her fears once. I opened the door and turned on a dim lamp. So she could see there was nothing but cobwebs, dad's tools, and scratched walls. She still didn't believe me. And I'd like to hide in the closet and listen to all you count outside. One, two, three, better hide from me. And then drag her feet on the creaking floorboards, hopping or hoping that she won't need to look for me in the cramped monster's den. 
I believe that's all you can see here. And you can't go outside yet. Emercom of Russia has declared the state of emergency due to adverse weather conditions. According to the weather forecast, a cyclone is moving towards the region. Expect heavy snowfall, blizzards, and snowdrifts on the road. Keep your eyes open and take care of yourself. A decrepit and stain-covered calendar was once my favorite form of entertainment in Grandma's house. I remember waking up and running to the kitchen so that I could tear off yesterday's leaf first thing in the morning, as if the coming day would get lost in the taiga forest without my help. One day closer to New Year's, one day closer to Grandma's funeral. I haven't touched this calendar for years now. Since the time that they started writing dark and spooky death chants that only made me gloomy instead of funny proverbs and superstitions to be exact. I grabbed the dusty calendar leaf with caution and tore it off effortlessly. Sadly, the spooky descriptions from my childhood were still there. Seven horses carried the log. If seven can't carry, bring the eighth from a fairy. They will take it away and never come back. This is the fate the log cannot escape. I crumpled the gray leaf and threw it into the waste bin, hoping to get rid of the anxiousness that washed over me. It was spreading inside me like an ink stain on blotting paper. Grandma kept ice cream for me and Olya there, but now I can only see meat bits for soup and clumped together. How many? I grew to hate them already. This looks like medication right there, both of these eye drops. Butter, I think. A, a lemon or lime. Uh, two things that are pickled. The sight of our old ocean freezer was checkered with my childish drawings. Mom's recipes and all kinds of stickers from bubblegum with dinosaurs that Oya liked so much. Among that still life picture hung a piece of ruler paper with the phone number of the police officer who visited us. First Lieutenant Tikhanov, Tikhanov? I read inside my mind, looking at the officer's sprawling handwriting. The scrap of paper was held by two pieces of, of a broken magnet from some old Soviet toy, and those pieces just barely covered the numbers as if to taunt me. I leaned towards it to unveil the mystery and take the piece to a safer place where it would wait for its time, when I would finally find Vova and be the first to call the police with the ha happy news. That is a very unfortunate name, Vova. Anton! Mom's reproachful eyes stared at me. What do you need this for? Hands off! You'll lose it. Angering my mom was the last thing that I wanted, so I lowered my hand. So I think you have to get rid of her. It was difficult to lie to mom, but there was no other way for me to run away from home. Mom, something's wrong with the TV. The picture is dim and there are stripes all over the screen. Mom's face became visibly distorted. <sighs> You're killing me here. So have you had enough of shooting those stupid ducks now? Told you the the kinscope will go dim because of your console. Where will we find a TV technician in this hole, huh? Mm, maybe it's just the settings? Uh, please go see for yourself. Strange, it worked fine in the morning. Maybe the snowfall caused it? Mom rubbed her hands clean on her apron and went to Olya's room. So now that she's gone... Senior Lieutenant Tikh Tikhonov Konstantin Vladimirovich Telephone number 20337 This is the last thing you can... I took a peek at mom's crossword. She would get very angry when someone gave her advice, so me and dad faked knowing the answer and being able to reveal it all the time. 
I smelled at that fleeting thought. Vertical, nine letters, the name of the Philistine deity that protected them from viper bites and had a nickname, the Lord of the Flies. Second letter is E. I believe that's all that we can do here. Yeah. She won't let me touch this. Anton, get your ass out of the closet immediately. That's so can. Anton, get your hands off the phone. But Jesus, Mom. I opened the front gate and went into the field. Carefully, so Mom wouldn't see me from the window. When I crossed half of the distance towards the forest, the snow piles became as high as my knees. I remember my nightly fears. Uh, give me a moment. The silhouettes I saw were around here. They were jumping around, holding hands. The hypnotizing music started playing in my head, all on its own. In the light of day, those distant figures felt like a simple dream. The sun turned my nightmares to ash, but the aftertaste was still there, distant ringing in my ears, distorted shadows crawling on the snow alongside me, and a barely audible whisper in my head, blurry and almost kind. Everything was silent. So silent that I felt like the world was totally empty. No ground, no sky, no parents, no Olya. The time reached its limit. A one-way trip that ended at the forest. Piney stockade. Sometimes silence was much more scary than any scream. Our parents would scream at each other while arguing, and both me and Olya turned to stone, listening to them. But then... Always came the ringing silence. Our out apart our apartment became numb a couple of days before we departed. It was hard to remember the last time mom and dad joked around, laughing or spent time together, almost like all of it was in a previous life. When they kissed with Alia present, she always frowned and snorted in a funny way. But one day it all changed. Something important had left our home and something scary filled the remaining void. It was as if a fire broke up, and our parents were hurriedly packing our belongings, trying to save themselves and us. From who, though? From the people with dead, cold eyes, who sometimes visited us in our previous home? The eyes that only saw balls of worms in the black ground and everything. And somewhere far away, a siren was going off, trying to warn us of the coming menace. I shuddered, chasing away my delusions and looked around. There were only me, this white field, and the wind that was whipping up the icy dust and belts of powdered snow. I squinted from the sun and turned my eyes to the sunless forest. It looked especially dark in contrast with the blinding whiteness. Knobby tree roots slithering under the snow like fat snakes. Rotten leaves and corniferous needles froze in the ice. Dry, prickly branches intertwined, bringing up uncomfortable thoughts about fences. Were they protecting the forest? Or were they keeping something from breaking out? Some object was hanging from one of the pointy branches. I tried to get closer, drowning in the snow, and when I almost got to the edge of the forest, I saw a knitted mitten. 
It looked like a wounded bird amongst the hungering semi-dark. Should I take it to the police? Their senior officer looked gloomy, but he still reminded me of Captain Casanova from my favorite TV show called The Streets of Broken Lights. He was also always anxious, with a tired look in his eyes, but still brave and strong. Will this man help them find the lost boy? Vova! I heard a distant shout, like it came from the river. Vova! As if the trees were calling out to someone. Vova! Resounded closer to me. There was someone standing there behind the trees, hiding. I knew someone was looking for the lost boy, but still, there was something unsettling about that figure. Its stillness, how it was bent unnaturally towards the ground, its blackness. There was no one there, just branches and roots. It's all just my imagination. A nearby bird flapped its wings loudly. A shadow split from the tree and disappeared from my sight. I looked away for just a moment, but then I turned my gaze back to the same place. It was gone. So, it was my imagination after all. Silence reigned for a painfully long time. My muscles were tightly sprung, my heart was beating somewhere in my throat. Any noise, any little movement, any small whisper from the thicket, and I'd sprint. But nothing of the sort happened. I looked at the mitten once more. Take it. I decided to take the lonely mitten from the branch. A shout rumbled across the field and dissolved into the distance. No echo, no hope for a reply. I stepped towards the bristly trees and tried to claim my find. It didn't budge. I pulled harder, the branch creaked and the mitten tore off, landing in my hand with a squishy sound. All too heavy, wet. I squeezed it without thinking and something dark spilled from it, forming a tiny string between the mitten and the snow. Steam rose from the snow pile. I froze in place, studying my palms in disgust. Red. The sound of cracking branches invaded the silence. I didn't have time to think twice before running away. Someone was chasing me from the darkness, breaking pine branches, closing the distance with giant leaps. Snow was slowing me down. Crazy thoughts flew through my mind. I'll get caught. They'll get me. I'll get dragged into the thicket. I'll be gone. Forever. But there was once more, one more voice, probably one of reason. It gave me strength, spurred me on. You can do it. Don't stop. I heard an animal roar behind me. It was so loud my ears went numb. It felt like the sound had come from a pack of hungry beasts rather than a single one. Their nostrils sucked in freezing cold air. They sensed my fear. Two giant wings flapped above my head. An enormous shadow flew over the clearing. A hoot. A wheeze. The roars were coming from all directions now from the dried up raspberry bush, from the twisted pines, from under the windfall. Hurry, run, don't look back. It felt like I was inside a nightmare. The snowy clearing became vicious like quicksand. I was stuck in place. I pulled my legs from the mushy trap just to be caught in a new one, even deeper than before. 
I continued to drown, sinking deeper and deeper with every desperate push. Was snow ever this sticky? I screamed in horror after realizing that this wasn't snow. Someone or something in the snow pile was clutching my pants. I gathered all my strength and rushed forward. The pressure of my leg was gone, my boots slipped out from the hole, and my soles were on a hard surface again. I reached a clear path with one jump and from there ran to my house. Its gloomy facade didn't look threatening now. The house was my line of defense from the shadows that flapped their wings and the creatures that were hidden under the snow. I tripped over the doorstep and smashed into the door. In all my hurry, I still managed to notice the claw marks, as if a dog was striking the wood with its paws, demanding to be let in so that it could escape the cold. I hadn't noticed these marks when I was leaving. The heartbeat in my ears was much louder than my surroundings. I couldn't hear whether someone was following me or not. What if they were already in our front yard and mom had locked the door? Drowning in fear, I pulled on the doorknob and it obediently gave way. I rolled into the hallway and shut the door behind me. Porch planks creaked as my pursuers ascended the stairs. My fingers slipped off the lock and I couldn't click it into place. I gritted my teeth and pulled hard on the iron knob, whipping it between the boards. I stared blankly at the door. Someone was standing on the other side of the pitiful, flimsy barrier that was probably less useful than blankets. Wheezing breath reached into the house and crashed at me in waves. It smelled of pine and sweat. Mom peeked out from the kitchen and chastised me with the same frigid voice that she always used when talking to Dad. What exactly didn't you understand when I told you to never slam the door? I, I didn't mean to. I snuck a glance at the door. The smell was gone, and the breath was too. If there was someone in the first place, of course. Here, mere five meters away from Mom, my fear was slowly weakening, melting like snow in spring, and with it the last bit of strength that I had left, my body too. My legs gave way. I propped myself up against the wall so that I wouldn't fall over. Mom's expression had changed immediately. The cold mask of strictness and detachment was gone. Mom looked the same as before all those quarrels. She saw my condition at last, my wet pants plastered with snow. Where have you been? What did I tell you, huh? I told you to stay home. Am I nothing to you? I got afraid that she would cry. I reached out to her like when I was very little and wanted her to cuddle me. But mom regained her composure fast and put on her usual face. Her eyes shined like steel. Her voice rang out. Your dad can't find his cigarettes. Be honest, did you snatch them? Are you smoking in secret? I... Uh, there was someone chasing me. I... I thought... I stuttered as soon as I started explaining myself. Tears welled up in my eyes. Mom leaned towards me and sniffed my clothes like a beast, searching for the smell of tobacco. Then she squinted her eyes in suspicion and looked into the front yard. Her expression changed in an instant, and she covered her mouth with her hand. Look, over there, at the fence. My heart started thumping, as if I became prey once again and my pursuers were still following me in the field. I could swear that I've heard something scratch at the door, just like my nightmare. Mom beckoned me with her finger, and I gathered all my remaining bravery to look into the kitchen window, facing my fear. I could barely discern some hairy silhouettes swimming in the snow through the icy winter patterns on the glass. Dogs. Just a small pack of strays with no name and owner, barely remi reminding of the hungry monsters that live on the edge of the forest. Oh boy, are you scared of them? I think I'd rather be scared of you, Anton. Oh, they'd be... I think they'd rather be scared of you. They were chasing me, like a bunny. And what if they were rabid? The smile had slowly disappeared from Mom's face. Now she looked at the dogs as if it was her first time seeing them. What if they attack Olya? Mom? I wish your dad would just shoot them all. 
Mom, look. They're alive. Huh? What? Are your... Are your friend or foe after all? Make up your mind. Are they your friend or foe after all? Make up your mind. You're not a little kid already. Mom sighed in annoyance and I felt so bitter that I bit my lower lip and fixed my gaze on the cobweb writ corner. Well, some detective I am. In reality, I wasn't risking my life amongst monsters, but rather my pants amongst a pack of stupid strays. And for what? What use do I have for this? Mitten. Of course. A darkened, sticky mitten that belonged to the lost boy made a squishy sound in my hand. Seems like I was clutching it the whole time. That's my trump card as a detective. I hurried to present this clue to my mom. Mom, look. This is a Volva's mitten. That boy the police was asking about in the morning. It's drenched in blood. I found it hanging on a tree. I can show you where. Let's call the police like the officer told us to. Mom, look. Ew. A shadow of doubt slowly crept onto my mom's contorted face. As if she was trying to remember something distant, like someone tries to remember their dream, but the images slip away. Stop at this moment. Oya will go insane if she hears you. She already has trouble sleeping and whines all the time. And you joke around like this. At that moment, I realized the mitten was actually wet from snow. There was no blood whatsoever. I wanted to sink through the floor from embarrassment. Come here, my boy, who cried wolf. Oh, don't just stand there. Come take your pills. A golden-colored pill, reminiscent of a dead wasp, fell onto my palm. I already took one during breakfast. Don't talk over me. I told you to stay home and you... Dad would have given you a good whipping for that. Come on, take it, or you won't be able to sleep at night, and you have school tomorrow. So I had to swallow the bitter medication, drinking it down with similarly awful water that gave off a taste of chlorine. Maybe it wasn't Volva's mitten. Maybe it wasn't a mitten at all. Just like the forest monsters. And Olya's owl. Hey, am I going mad? What's happening to me? Either the pill had an immediate effect, or my overexerted brain didn't let fear inside anymore. Serenity washed over me, bringing yawny and difference along with it. Anton, you done? See, you, you could do it when you try. Take off your coat. Are you asleep? No, Mom. I was just thinking. What about, I wonder? It's uh, just something silly. Mom scrutinized me with suspicious eyes. As if she wasn't sure that she was looking at her own son and not some doppelganger that came from the forest. Is everything all right? You had the same exact expression when the policeman asked you about the window. I am all right, Mom. She heaved a deep sigh. Fine. It seemed like the house had changed. The sofa's fabric had become discolored. Fingerprints appeared on the bathroom tiles. The light bulbs also felt different, dimmer and yellower. Even the saliva inside my mouth had a different taste. A melody from Aladdin could be heard from the upper floor. Oya was done rewatching her favorite Little Mermaid episodes and switched to the other tapes. I slowly changed into my home clothes and stopped for the sink and studied my reflection in the mirror, like I was trying to solve one of those spot the difference puzzles. Then I went upstairs. Jafar and Iago's voice died down. I walked past Olya's bedroom and slipped into my own. I think that's Olya. I've dreamt of becoming an artist since Dad had brought me my first comic book. Fly Magazine was the coolest. I especially liked the big space-related edition with alien monsters and that funny episode about a... Gardem... Gardemy? Gan... Gan... Gandormy? I started drawing all kinds of stuff since that day, 
and I seem to be getting pretty good at it. One of my letters even got published in Fly once. Maybe someday they'll even publish my comic. My Triceratops figurine. I know about all sorts of dinosaurs, Velociraptors, Afrovenators, Hypsilophodons. I remember going to the movies to see Jurassic Park back when we still lived in the city and taking pictures of the T-Rex in the hall. It turned its head and roared. It was awesome. And besides it was a Robotech Transformer. I love this cartoon. When a jet fighter speeds up into the intro among the sounds of blaster fire, you know your next 20 minutes will surely be amazing. Centridi? Space Station is captured. Rick, get ready for battle. There's something over here, is there? Oh. Monstrous ghosts, UFOs. An encyclopedia of paranormal phenomenon from Ramsam Publishing. I've learned about the Loch Ness monster, Medusa Gorgon, and Bigfoot from there. Olya was always scared of the book. She could barely handle sifting through the monster and alien sections with me, but the middle part where they start to talk about ghosts really freaked her out. I even remember hunting ghosts after I read the book. I measured the distance between items on my table every evening and checked if they moved due to some supernatural force come the morning. They didn't. But to be honest, what was I expecting? To meet Casper the ghost? Gee, I wonder who's right here. The forest didn't look as grim during the day. Entangled the branch trees in the distance and the snowy fields between the, our houses and the forest brought sleepiness to my eyes. But sometimes I would still catch myself looking in the window at the icy treetops instead of doing my homework. Hello? Well, I guess we're not gonna talk to her. One of the drawers was empty. I hit the policeman's phone number along with the mitten there. The simple action drained the last bit of strength from me. I sat on my bed. And only then that I noticed that there was someone behind the curtains. My tired hand dropped to the sheets. Whether it was due to medication that I took or the stress that I underwent, the room began to contort as if the wind was blowing the walls out like a pair of sails. The room's corners bent and undulated. The only staple thing in the whole room was the figure behind, between the windowsill and the curtains. A flimsy piece of cloth was stuck to my hidden visitor, just like a servant, oh, a savant of sorts. Olya? Who else would be standing there? I stood up and licked my dried up lips. Yeah, Olya. It's so funny. The silhouette was unmoving. It was enveloped softly by the curtains. As if there was a thick layer of darkness there, not a human being. I reached towards the curtains. Badum, badum, beat my heart, controlled by medication. The wind sang in the fort, field, with a chorus of voices. For a second, I wanted to return to the bed, just lie down and watch the person behind the curtain, knowing full well that they were looking back at me. They're looking without blinking, waiting for me to fall asleep. Plastic rings rustled against the holder when I pulled open the curtains. Gotcha! I knew it was you from the beginning. A blindingly bright halo lit up over Olya's head with the setting sun in the background. My sister was shining. When she was just a baby, Dad always used to say that she was shining with happiness. I always retorted, but Dad, she's not some flashlight. But I brought her to the window one day, and sunlight poured on her smiling face. I felt like I was holding a child woven from light. I saw everything. Oh, really? Hmm. What did you hide? She was just like Mom, and when she was little, before she could put on her sad mask of tiredness and switch to her commanding tone of voice. It's nothing, just... Oya ran up to the table, her eyes round, and asked. You stole something and hid it there? 
Are you a thief? What? Don't be stupid. I didn't steal anything. A clear image came to mind. That meaning hanging from a tree branch. What if I did steal it after all? From the forest, from the tilted figure standing behind black trees. Olya could be selfish and stubborn when she wanted. Then show me. Swear that you won't tell anyone then. I'll show you. Olya wore a plotting smile. I swear on mom's heart. An oath that she heard in one of the movies about the pioneers that we've watched. Don't say things like that. Oya nodded and made a gesture with her hand, locking her mouth with an imaginary key. She was filled with curiosity that was splashing in her giant eyes. I opened the drawer and Oya leaned in, holding her breath. I looked like there was not just a simple mitten, but some sort of exotic creature. Is this someone's mitten? She said that as if she couldn't understand what she saw. A certain boy lost it, and got lost himself. Now you do understand how dangerous it is for kids to wander into the forest, right? He must be really cold out there. Will they find him? They will. The police is going house to house, showing this photo to everybody. Oya traversed the room with care and pressed her tiny palms against the window. And where are they going to house the house and not the forest? Are they scared? The question caught me off guard. The police isn't scared of anything. Yeah, right, flashed in my clouded mind. Did they really check every nook and cranny where darkness cold and whispers of icy branches dwell? If that's the case, how did they miss the mitten? Or did it appear later, for me? I changed the topic. As if trying to get Olya as far away as possible from the forest thicket. We may get a reward if I go and find this boy myself. A lot of stuff, like in Field of Wonders. Sounds cool, right? Olya wasn't listening to me. She was piercing the forest with incredibly adult eyes, uncharacteristic for her. What if the owl got him? Nonsense. An owl won't be able to lift a human. But you know what? I was picking my words with utmost care. I forced them out of my overexerted brain. Stay away from the forest. I think it's... I think it's... How should I put it? It's cursed or something. Just like a fairy tale? No, not like that. More like in the spooky tape mom and dad are hiding from us. Oya shivered and stole a glance at the window. I saw you running away. Someone was chasing you? No, it's just... I was hurrying back home so mom wouldn't be worried. As I looked at my sister, my heart was tearing apart. Was she so fragile? Oh, she was so fragile. It was so easy to stifle her light. A gust of wind and her s small fire would be gone. You're lucky. Mom won't ever let me go outside. I'm like a princess in the tower. Can't go anywhere. I'll die from boredom here. You're wrong. No one has ever died of boredom. And you have me and your cartoons. And Mom and Dad will be good to each other soon. You know what I would wish for on my next birthday? I'd wish for mom and dad to turn into children so that we could go and play together like we used to. Yeah, and if you'd make them as small as bugs, we could place them in a little box. Oya giggled and tugged at my sleeve. Tony, let's go watch Aladdin. Fatigue won over my desire to be with my little sister. I was washed over by some sort of heinous apathy. I'm too tired. I don't want to. Come on. It's so boring and alone and mom is always busy. We can pick a cartoon that you haven't seen before. I know all of her tapes by heart at this point. 
Not all of them. You haven't watched Peter Pan. Remember how you fell asleep in the middle of it? And so much happens after that. Let's go, let's go. Maybe a bit later. Should I tell you how it ends? Let's leave that for tomorrow. I won't tell you tomorrow. I know. Let's play hide and seek. No, Oya. Then draw me a dino. Oya, please. Draw it, draw it. Will you leave me alone already? I blurted it out without thinking, and then I was immediately taken aback. I never screamed at my little sister like that. Oya stared at me in shock. Her lips started trembling, a precursor to tears. My chest was seething with disgust and embarrassment. What's happening to me? I hurried to prevent Oya from crying. <sighs> Alright, you win. Let's go watch cartoons for a bit. I don't wanna... I came up to her, putting my hands on her soft head. Let's go. Let's go watch Peter Pan. Boo! You'll fall asleep again. I smiled and lifted her chin. Her eyes were wet and felt bottomless. I promise I won't. And I'll draw you a full triceratops later. Hooray! Try peg sire pops. Eh, well, close enough. Oya rubbed her eyes with the sleeve of her pajamas and a shining smile returned to her face. I'll go ask mom for condensed milk and bread, and you can rewind the tape. The bread is fresh, just like how you like it. Alright, just be careful not to spill the milk. Or you'll be yelled at again. Wanna bet that I won't spill it? The tape is somewhere in the nightstand. Look for it. Oya disappeared into the doorway, and I dragged my feet into the neighboring room. piggy bank. Oya is saving some money for a real puppy because dad said that taking care of him will take a lot of money. The scary window where Oya sees the cursed owl every night, lurking in the dark. Oya keeps curtains open during the day, but as soon as the twilight comes, she shuts them tight so she wouldn't see the pair of hungry eyes outside. That's a weird sound for a bear to make. Oh yes, countless toys. An old teddy bear is the main attraction here. Oya doesn't sleep without it. And she digs her nose into its fur when she sleeps. Doggy. Isn't that like the, the Pixar ball? Chip and Dale, Rescue Rangers. The old photon, photon TV was gathering dust in the corner. All that was left was clicking the button on the front panel. The two warmed up and familiar white noise started dancing on the black screen. I almost reached out to turn on the VCR when the noise calmed down and a blurry image appeared for a moment. It was... A dark taiga force, just like the one outside my window. The picture split the screen in half. Something creepy resembling human speech was coming out of the speaker. Just a few moments later, the scenery was again overshadowed by noise. Did it catch some rogue signal? The local TV station only really showed Soviet cartoons, and even that was pretty rare. And only just recently, I used to always watch Robotech before school. It was awesome. Maybe I should tinker for the antenna. What if I catch this channel again? On the other hand, Oya had asked me to find the tape. It wouldn't be nice to disappoint her. But in my sleepy state, I didn't have the strength to do all of it. So you can set the TV to the channel or look for the tape. I think it would be better to look for the tape. I 
I sifted through the shelves full of dolls and blue hippos from the Kinder Surprise. They look like, um, what is it called? Um, Moomin? There's a Predator VHS right there. Uh, yeah, I think that's the only one that I can make out. Did I say Pocahontas? No, I don't know what that is. Eh. I found the tape that I needed thanks to the shabby spine. I got the black rectangle from its box. The tape inside of it rustled while rewinding to the beginning. This rustle was lulling me to sleep. I just noticed that the VCR says, Orion. We used to have th this exact same VCR. Drowsiness attacked me while I was squatting before the TV. Images whirled in my head, me and Olya flying over the forest, tumbling in the soft clouds. My little sister is laughing, but her smile becomes more and more forced with every passing second. I notice that the clouds underneath us part, bearing the bristly pine tops. Swampy darkness slurped among the trees. The wi wings are no longer able to hold us in Olya. You started? No, you haven't started without me, have you? My sister brought the tray with unevenly cut bread and a whole can of condensed milk. I rubbed my eyes. No, come sit. Mom and Dad are arguing again. They're going through rough times. Rough times are lame. I'm assuming that means on the screen. Wendy was hiding Peter Pan's shadow in, into the dresser. Olya was entertained by the cartoonish dog, Nana. Maybe mom and dad will buy us a dog too? Yeah, right. I have my own dog in Neverland and a cat and a parrot. Olya smeared a slice of bread with a thick layer of condensed milk and handed it to me. Have you lost all of your baby teeth? No, have you lost all of your baby teeth? Obviously. Olya frowned, deep in thought. Peter Pan has baby teeth. What if they won't let you go to this land with adult teeth? Eh, we'll think of something. We'll ask Dad to alter your age in the passport. And why would Dad forge documents? Oya took a bite from the sandwich and started talking with her mouth full. Will you, he will, he will, Mom. They did that before. You'll grow ears as big as Dumbo's. Oya got worried and touched your ears. I smiled to myself. My little sister was silent now. She just devoured bread watching the adventures of Peter Pan and Tinkerbell and James Hook as if she got stuck into the fairy tale Neverland. To be honest, I also imagined myself there in a land where one never ages, where no one argues over little things, where no one listens to fights and the sound of broken plates at night. It felt like I was dreaming with my eyes still open. Then my sister's scream pulled me back to reality. Tony, shut the curtains fast! Why? No one's watching you. Uh -huh, well, no one's watching you. It's dark, and when it's dark, the owl comes. I I'm, I'm scared. I got out of bed, finding my drowsiness, and closed the curtains. I did my best not to look outside, towards the treetops, towards the taiga forest, which seemingly drew closer and closer. Of course, it was just a visual effect from the shadows of branches scraping the snow. Tony, Mom thinks I made up the owl. And Dad, too. Thinks I'm a liar since I'm small. But the owl exists. Honestly, honestly, it does. Do you believe me, right? That it comes every night and... And... I swiftly grabbed Olya's hand and looked into her eyes. I was trying to transfer at least some of my courage and determination. But did I really have those qualities? Yes, I believe you, all right? Just don't nag our parents about it anymore. They're already dealing with a lot, so they'll just get mad at you. Come and tell me if anything happens. And don't look out the window. 
but it wants me to look. Doesn't matter. Act like it doesn't exist and never existed. Like it's made up. Just like mom and dad say. It'll get tired of waiting and fly away. It was madness, but after everything that's happened recently, I was more and more inclined to believe Olya's owl existed. We followed Peter Pan's adventure as if nothing had happened, as if the forest didn't kidnap kids, as if our parents weren't tearing each other apart bit by bit. Captain Hook was running away from a crocodile, and Captain Pan was headed to London on a gilded sailboat. By some miracle, I lasted longer than my little sister. Oya's eyelids had dropped. She started snoring, lightly, resting her chin on the side of the bed. I stood up and left Oya's room. I was looking out the window, studying the field when my mom peeked into my room. Enough playing around. It's your first day of school tomorrow. Go to bed. You should sleep properly. You don't want to be teased by being sleepy, right? Adults think everything is so simple. As if sound sleep would ensure my classmates would like me. I covered myself with a blanket up to my neck and listened to the house humming to something invisible rustling in the corners. My inner voice had a question for me. Do I want to hear that mysterious flute again? Yes or no. Maybe it's just a part of growing up and I can't fully understand my own desires. The forest wailed behind the barrier that were my walls. Some ethereal entity wandered the fields. Branches shook as if calling for me. The wind howled on and on in the night. My thoughts were like annoying flies that entered my head before becoming weak and tangled. I didn't notice how I fell into slumber. Thank you for completing episode 1 of Tiny Bunny. Did you enjoy it? Do you want to know what happens next? We're already working hard on the continuation of the story. It's too bad that nothing has come out yet. And like I said, it's been... a year now? A little over a year, I think? Um, apparently it's on Steam, or it's going to be on Steam. I'm not exactly sure what this is. Here's a Twitter thing and... whatever this is. Um, but yeah. So like I said, that was the first chapter of Tiny Bunny. Obviously, this has a lot of spooks. It's very... I feel that it's going to be very... Um, I think the word is kinetic, meaning that, like, depending on what you choose to do throughout the story, different things will happen. Um... You could have probably left the mitten there and the things might not have chased you. Um, you could have also set the TV to see what happens. Um, but yeah, like I, I think those were the only two real interesting points of the story or like the, the two interesting things that might have um, given a different result. Um... Uh, I'm assuming the the guy, the thing on the right is the owl. Because it kind of looks like right here where the in the middle of the eyes, it kind of looks like a beak. A little. I'm not really sure about an owl having ears. Or I, I know there's a horned owl, but like I don't think that's it, is it? Anyways, um. I am curious to see what this bunny that we see right here in the in the cover, what they're about, what they're going to be in the story. You know, if the story does continue to be made. I think I heard something about this story, but I don't really remember what. Um, I believe that the story is in Russian. So considering what's going on right now, I don't know if um if we'll be getting more from it until you know what ha what is happening right now stops happening 
uh, it would suck if it just sort of ends here because this is a very, um, it has potential. It has a lot of potential. It, it has the spooks. The art style is amazing. And they clearly took a lot of work and also like the audio and everything, everything about the story was just awesome. I really hope that the people here in the channel that normally don't like spooky stuff, like at least saw the video. Like if you're at this point of the story, at least, you know, give the video a like. <laughs> like and subscribe to the channel. But yeah, so, um... It would be disappointing, but understandable if the story does not continue. Uh, that being said, I am looking forward to seeing what happens. So yeah. Anywho, so write down in the comments what you think, and thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play Tiny Bunny yourself, you can do so by going down into the link in the description, and I will try to link to uh, HIO and see if YouTube is okay with it, because, like, this isn't uh, FNV, so, you know... Um, I do not think that they have any way of supporting the project. So, yeah... Anywho, so I hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.